So let us get on to the first um, scenario, which I've got to put on the screen here. And I'm just going to read it out. And then we're going to chew on it and see what would we be thinking about? How might we address these challenges? So it says, the most distressing symptom for me is the non-stop bleeding. I wonder if the standard procedure done at the hospital, in brackets, she says, DNC, after the loss of a pregnancy at five to six months along, to be certain the whole placenta came out was enough to create scar tissue that now later in perimenopause is causing this heavy fibroid issue so that's the first question and it is i think the key things there are um, having a dnc which is a uh, well a term that refers to a termination procedure surgical termination and that was around five to six months and the question is whether it was enough to create scar tissue that is now probably years later causing heavy fibroid issue so that's the first question um dr tolu so yeah what are your thoughts around this particular scenario this is something that a lady is experiencing. Thank you. Reading the question, I can pick what is said and what is unsaid about this question. And oftentimes with fertility, you always have to think about the psychological concerns behind some questions. Or in fact, even when it comes to the perimenopause, for instance, you have to think of the psychological um, background to the questions. So this is a lady who unfortunately needed to have a DNC after um, delivery, I believe. Yeah. And um, years later she now starts to have bleeding in what she considers to be perimenopause i think the questions i need to be asking myself is i mean how many years later is this what was the delivery about was this a routine normal delivery or was this a delivery that was mired in some sort of emotional upheaval at the time and therefore has led to quiet concerns about her reproductive or pelvic organs not necessarily veered towards a fertility but just our reproductive organs on a whole and the fact that she also wonders whether the abnormal bleeding she's having now in the perimenopause is linked to the dnc because they're both in the same area so there are quite many questions i'd like to um, ask her or there are many things i'd like to explore but looking at the formal approach i think certainly getting a pelvic ultrasound scan to identify why she's having this abnormal bleeding once we can confirm it from her menstrual diary will be very useful because what's abnormal to her may not necessarily be abnormal when you look at it very very objectively so that's where a menstrual diary is useful i know we've got different apps at the moment now that are so useful um i think flow comes to mind readily i remember the first time a patient walked through the door and said oh do you want to check my flow app out i was like what <laughs> so yes so that certainly would help in identifying what irregularity we're looking at because could it be that it's irregular but it's spotting could it be that it's irregular but it's heavy bleeding is it irregular in the sense that her bleeding carries on or is it irregular that she spots every week you know we, we need to understand the cycle the pattern to it and certainly now she's saying to me she's in the perimenopause i definitely would want to have a pelvic ultrasound scan once i've ascertained the history to see whether things like polyps which is like skin tag or the abnormal thickening to the of the womb lining is present because she's thinking it's a dnc and well, in actual fact it may not be a dnc you know related issue she's thinking it might be fibroids yes there might be fibroids and actually guess what she might have had those fibroids on for a very long time which is why she needed a dnc in the first place because we do know that sometimes depending on the way a fibroid sits within the womb when the placenta comes up that's the bit that feeds the baby the placentas may not come away completely and therefore she might need to have a DNC at that point in time to, as it were, sweep away or scrape away whatever leftover placenta there is. So it's not the DNC in itself that has led to abnormal bleeding. It's most probably that she's always had fibroids there in the, you know, in, all along. However, I find it quite interesting, though, that even though she's always had fibroids all along, she has not been symptomatic up until now. So which is why I need to get a little bit more history from her yes. to know exactly what's going on and um, then have a scan to identify and like i said at the bottom scar tissue as you would expect from a dnc behaves mm -hmm. very differently to fiber tissue scar tissue doesn't bleed like that fiber tissue might bleed that way so it's good to get a little bit but for her to think it's a dnc whatever issues she's got behind the dnc that's irrelevant she should not worry too much about that let's just 
you know, take it on the face of it, get the investigations on board, and I'm sure she'll be able to get answers from a healthcare provider. Okay, that's amazing. I, I think that's really useful. It's always important to preface this discussion with the fact that this is by no means specifically a medical advice. It is simply a discussion and just to educate about how we as clinicians look at issues and the implication of one thing might be very, it, it, in our minds, might be very different to what you're thinking. And as you said, we need a lot more information from this lady to be able to start to tease out what is connected, what is related, what is the duration of certain events, what's the distance between when, or what's the time lap, lapse between when one event happened and the other. So the key thing here is that she needs to sit down with her practitioner and whether it's a GP to start with and then a referral on to gynecology if they do pick out that there are any um, abnormalities. I think from the question, she was trying to link the presence of scar tissue from the DNC to heavy fibroid bleeding, which generally would not be the case. The presence of DNC and fibroid and uh, scar tissue does not lead to fibroids. Let's go to the very next question, which I'm going to put on the screen now, and I'm just going to read it out. So that's question number two. And this is a lady who said, I always feel like something is moving at my abdomen and my stomach. I urinate frequently and have gained weight too. I crave for any appetizing smell of food and my belly keeps looking like a pregnant lady, mostly feeling discomfort and fatigue with a little work. I have found out that I have fibroid and ovarian cyst. I think this is ovarian cyst, which has made me anxious and depressed thinking about it. So this is a comment, uh, not necessarily a question, but it is a, a comment. Totally. So what, what do you think with the, the details that she's, you know, what she's going through and how might this be explained? So thank you for that. The slide I've put there has focused on the fibroids rather than the ovarian cyst, but I'll also yeah. make, we'll be making mention of the ovarian cyst. Now, so she's saying she's got increased urination, she's got something rolling in her abdominal pelvis, and then she's got the abdominal distension. Now, I think the things that were running through my mind is number one, how old is this lady in question? Hmm. So if she was a much younger woman, and then in the addition to that, how big are this ovarian cysts? Because oftentimes, little cysts may be seen on scan and just mentioned, you know, perfunctorily, yeah. not necessarily being a large cyst, you see. So I need to know that because if she was to have a huge ovarian cyst, I think that actually takes precedence over, you know, treatment for her fibroids. Okay. Because with a huge ovarian cyst, we want to make sure that there is no concerning features that we need to be worried about, i.e. the big C word. Is there a likelihood of ovarian cancer here? More okay. so with the increased uh, abdominal distension. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go into ovarian cysts because this is not the essence of our discussion today. Mm -hmm. But certainly I would be wanting her to have a chat with a healthcare provider. Um, there are tumor markers that she can get from blood tests yes. in order to reassure her, reassure her and also to help form, inform for the management. But let's imagine that her symptoms are largely related to her fibroids. And, yeah. and given the fact that it's rolling, I think this begins to sound like a pedunculated fibroid. So remember what we talked about with the FIGO types of fibroids. So we're talking FIGO type 7 or type 8 here, mm -hmm. whereby there's a thin stalk and then there's a big fibroid with normal. And depending on her position, if she was to lean forward, say boom, straight onto her bladder and I can imagine mm. that will make her want very to be able to do as often yeah. as possible. Very uncomfortable, small volume but frequent weed. And if mm. it was to go backwards, then of course that will have an impact on her bowels resulting in constipation. Yes. Now, with regards to treatment, um, I've put their hormonal versus surgery. I certainly would want to have more information because if it's also an acutely tilted uterus with a fondal fiber, you see, that will also give this sort of um, feeling because all she has to do is tilt around and because of the effects of gravity, the big fondal fiber tilts the uterus banging, you know, forward and then she was to lean back and it tilts it all the way back. So the, the rolling in the abdomen, you know, we've got to interpret it depending on what we find on scan. So yes, yes um, the gold standard would be a scan again, a pelvic ultrasound scan to have an idea of what exactly is going on. If that was not to provide adequate information, then I think, of course, going down the route of a pelvic and abdominal MRI would yes. give more information, more so if there were to be cysts involved and we wanted to see what sort of cyst, or um, when I say cyst, I mean ovarian cyst involved to see what sort of ovarian you know, pathology we're dealing with. Surgery-wise will depend on what we find. So yes. be it laparoscopic, if it's a small but pedunculated fibroid or 
could it be even a, an open surgery if it's a large multifibroid uterus that means a uterus for a womb that has many fibroids you know to take it all away and of course we may also be thinking of hysterectomy if for instance she's that woman who's got to that stage of life whereby yes. she's completed a family and we put, um, and fertility needs no longer is you know uh, on the plate so quite a huge range of things we could mm. do for her certainly having a little bit more information having the blood test plus i mean sorry having the pelvic scan plus blood test depending on the information she's able to provide will be the way forward absolutely i think the other things that she mentions that also struck me she referred to feeling let me just put her question back on she says um she's feeling very anxious and depressed but she also talked about feeling fatigued with a little work and um of course we have to think about she doesn't mention it but we have to think about anemia and wonder perhaps the fibroids are causing a lot of bleeding for her and could she be anemic um, and then something else that is very we assume it but we don't i don't think we uh i don't think we objectively assess the toll the mental toll or the emotional toll that fibroids can have on ladies whether it is the symptoms physical symptoms directly or the business of trying to get a diagnosis in some cases or the stress of worrying about the treatment and trying to make a decision because like we said before in different conversations it is important for every woman to sit and have that individual chat with her doctor to be clear on what best suits her what best suits the fibroids that she has and everything with regards to her circumstance and so on so uh, the mental and emotional aspects are quite important and i think that is something that we have to recognize for our ladies and also pay attention she's feeling anxious and depressed there are many reasons that could be the case apart from the fact that she's so uncomfortable running to the toilet every so often and i, I thought this was an in sympathetic but also interesting one to show just this is the reality of some women with the condition like this right so the next Next one I'm just going to put up on the screen. So this is our question number three. It says, I'm 40 years old, smoke, and my periods are irregular. But the last two that I have have been fairly heavy and lasted a month or a little over. What do you suggest I do? I've seen my doctor and she suggested an ablation. But I've read that they're not 100% effective always and can be not such a great thing to do. So again, I want to put a disclaimer here that we're not telling this lady what to do. That's not why we're here. We don't, we can't tell her what to do because there's a wealth of information that we don't have about her. So we can't do that. But I did think this was an interesting one again to present because again, this is a real life scenario. Having some education about what fibroids could potentially do and the treatment options it's in, is important. So there are a few things that she touched on and I can see from your slide that Dr. Tolu, you've picked up, your eagle eyes have picked up a few things that you want to, <laughs> you want to analyze. So please go for it. So great. So yeah, she, she says she's a 40 year old she's a smoker with a regular heavy period and she's talking about ablation she's mm -hmm. not mentioned whether she's got fibroids or not so mm -hmm. yes this could be a fibroid and it could be several other things and that's why i've made a mention about ruling out skin tags or polyps and also ruling out the lining of the womb being excessively thick for that Good age point. and also point. for her menstrual um, cycle. In the absence of getting a firm diagnosis, given her age and also the fact that her periods are becoming irregular, though heavy, you could also consider this to be a dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which we tend to see at the extremes of reproductive life okay. so we're talking around about 15 well 11 to 15 and then we're talking about 40 to 45 or even 55 where we know that the ovarian release is not as regular okay. and as a result of that it's the cycles become a bit haphazard well before jumping into that diagnosis we've got to rule out other common factors mm -hmm. now i do not know what other comorbidities she carries so i do not know what her circumstances are i do not know what her other health care conditions or concerns are but certainly smoking has never been a good thing <laughs> yes. so the first thing i'll be saying to her is to reduce her smoking because mm -hmm. a smoking a reduction in smoking will certainly help with her overall health optimization yes, yes. certainly would help with her ability to con um, to get over hpv colonization because for all we know are we entirely certain that she doesn't have a sort of cervical condition leading yeah. into this disease I'm okay. not saying it is completely cervical, no, but I'm saying could there be something from the cervix leading to this? We have no history of her smear history. Hmm. We have no, you know, we do not know what her, how many children she's had. So whether yes. she's, an, she's got an atropion or, you know what I mean? Yes. 
And yes. from her, it's irregular heavy periods. Really? I need to see the menstrual diary again mm-hmm. to be able mm-hmm. to say categorically it is what it, it is. Mm-hmm. So once you've been able to get a pelvic scan out of the way to rule out a polyp, which tends to be common in this sort of time period and rule out fibroids in this sort of time period, and we do not worry about any sort of cervical condition at the same time, I think an ablation is a wonderful idea. I simply think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, we do know that third generation ablations will give you as much as 87% success rate in managing heavy periods. If you can you clarify, not- can you clarify for us the third generation ablation, how, how it relates to okay. this case? So third generation ablations are the ones we, I mean, a good example is a Novashow endometrial ablation, for instance. Ah, yes. And that, I think, is readily available in a lot of United Kingdom hospitals. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have thought as many as 80% of hospitals, if not more, actually perform that sort of um, ablative um, technique. Yes. Um, apart from the Novashow, we also have different generic models by other companies like um, Smith and Nephew. So yours doesn't, your specialist may not necessarily provide you Nova Shore as yeah. it is, but, but as long as it's an endometrial ablator of a third generation so they're talking of 87% thereaboutish, give or take. The actual study that picked up 87% actually, I have to say, was specific to Nova Shore. So Maybe I need to retract them, actually. But okay. we know that, particularly in women who are going towards the perimenopause, um, the success rates are very good, not just in the first year, in the first three years, or even ongoing for the next five years. Because why? The, the fact is, their periods are getting anovulatory because their ovaries are not producing as many eggs as before. Yes. So therefore, there's a natural decline anyway. Yes. Okay. To their um, egg production, and by default, you could argue to their bleeding. Mm-hmm. So i uh, having an ablation on board to strip off that lining of the womb that replicates itself through every menstrual cycle mm-hmm. only accelerates the woman's progression yes to either a reduced bleed or even in some cases a completely period free um, uh, a bleed free period so yes she gets the heaviness in the boobs she knows the periods are coming on but she does not bleed at all okay, any bleeding. okay. Uh, a lot of services a lot of healthcare providers would actually provide it as an outpatient intervention so that obviates the need for general anesthetic that takes away the risk of you know perioperative risks and complications mm-hmm. associated with general anesthetic so, yeah. so it's, it's all shades of good and the woman returns back to work sooner rather than later rather than taking time out from work you know to stay at home to recuperate so I do not think an ablation is a bad Thing, particularly if there's absence of pathology. So the key takeaway points really are her overall health, the, the fact that she's come to us, we need to look at the smoking and give her that advice that overall health will be improved by stopping or cutting down on smoking in the first instance. Then the second point is let's establish exactly what's going on here and you know the scan will be useful to make a diagnosis and then the idea in the absence of any any pathology, in the absence of any of those other problems. So if it's just a dysfunctional you try and bleed then having an ablation would provide her relief from those symptoms but the key thing is that we need to work out why has her period pattern changed it might be perimenopausal but it could be so many other things we can't just assume okay marvelous right. and, I, and i think here yeah, i might also want to hard because i think i was so focused on ablation because that's what she specifically asked for yes the pre-ablation she could also consider a myrina My, the, that, that's a progesterone intrauterine system absolutely absolutely depending on what the cause yes yes or intervention yeah. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So let's get to the next question. Thank you so much, Dr. Tolu. Please, guys, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Um, where is question number four? Here we go. So this says, I was diagnosed with fibroids at the age of 15, but I think it was due to having to take birth control. And she says, no, I wasn't sexually active. I was diagnosed with ovarian cysts when I started my period at 13. Doctors thought birth control would help, but it actually made the problem worse. I don't know how many times um, I've come across this kind of scenario. Somebody's just not happy um, starting hormones at this age and not happy with the side effects, particularly thinking that it has led to developing fibroids. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, what you think. I'm sure that you also be familiar with ladies who come with this, you know, this kind of um, experience. This is a particularly difficult case because you've got a young girl here who's clearly very distressed. Mm-hmm. 
about you know the care she's received and how yes. unfortunately rather than relieve one pathology it's unfortunately led in her mind to another pathology another, uh, yeah and it'll be quite difficult actually to 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 reassure her fully um although it says that age of 13 I, I think for me i'd like to know more yes because it's one thing to say assist but was it a cyst i.e was she polycystic for instance rather than having a huge cyst because they're two different things and we know that sometimes because she's gone into birth control that may take away other features of polycystic ovarian syndrome that is true so the regular yes. Beans, yes you know and then by default she's been treated so the hirsutism the androgenic features may not necessarily show yeah so i really would want to know the full state of play mm. at the age of 13 yeah. and then uh, i think what i might want to do is um consider with a pill she's on is it something to tweak whereby we get her on something that has more progesterone rather than estrogen because we know estrogen is what's related to fibroid growth mm. and as men as much as we do not have a significant number of cases of estrogen pills with fibroid growth we do know there's an association no matter yes. how we yes. so we've got to be very careful we, we we as much as we are trying to i think it's a case whereby we have to be very careful to assess and understand what the risk benefit ratio is mm. and she has to be guided along as to how to go forward with it so it may well be do we consider taking her from ocps to pop so that's oral contraceptive pills which has a combination of both hormones onto pop which just has progesterone al alone yes. and then even with that do we consider maybe putting her on the mini pops so that's a smaller dose progesterone because of course we know that ovarian cysts are also associated with progesterone you know that <laughs> and either still girl who's already having large cysts if that was confirmed then of course you want to minimize the likelihood are having you know large assist in the future because then we worry about things like ovarian tosha which yes. will certainly have an impact on our fertility going forward in, into the future so it's something that needs to be carefully looked at look at all the um, pieces of evidence feeding into it so we can then get the right agent now she says she's sec not sexually active but that does not say to me that she has never been sexually active and that's why i've put down to consider the progestogen um, intrauterine system mm. because the beauty of that is she does not have a huge amount going into her bloodstream immediately she just has a little amount and that in itself also helps to shrink whatever fibroids are being found I, I, now yeah. two years down the line and hopefully by default will also put her at a lesser risk as compared to oral progestogen which is a high amount okay of developing large ovarian cysts so it's a it's a, it's a fine line to walk it's a thin rope to walk on but it's it's doable but as mm. long as she understands what the risk benefit ratios are for all or any of the interventions um hopefully we can increase her compliance and also her happiness or satisfaction mm. when her intervention is given. yeah that's amazing as you spoke and you described the different the different issues in this case uh, it struck me as well that this is a this is a tricky one just as you said and again disclaimer people we're not diagnosing or we're not treating here there is limited information you can just you can see on the slide the the only facts we have we literally have two sentences of facts <laughs> there's no way any doctor is going to treat you on this information so it's i always say to people wanting to get information wanting to get ad advice on the youtube um channel that like your questions are welcome i direct you to um, an email health information service i direct you back to your health practitioner um or your specialist to speak to speak about this then sit down with you, get the nitty gritty, get the details so that you're getting the um, tailored response, just like what Dr. Tony is saying here about the possibilities. But I know that historically, there is a connection in many people's minds between the pill and uh, going on the pill and then PCOS, for example, because as you said taking the pill will calm down many of the symptoms of pcos so the person doesn't even realize that they've got pcos and then they come off the pill to start a family and then have issues with fertility and not realize that actually you've always had pcos but the pill simply calmed your symptoms down so it's not the pill that made you infertile that's another discussion or people also have the mindset that well i had fight i had really very bad bleeding the doctor didn't even examine they didn't do anything all they did was they just stuck me on the pill mm -hmm. and then 20 years mm -hmm. later i now realize that i've got fibroids mm -hmm. and making that connection so mm -hmm. while not 
saying that the fibroid mm-hmm. may not have some effect mm-hmm. on the sorry the pain may not have some effect on the fibroids i think there's imp- it's important to have that discussion with the information that we have through research a lot of it is still controversial yes but it's always good to have that discussion with our ladies to clarify to explain and hopefully that would help with compliance because what you said if she uh, with fibroids if, if she hasn't been put off birth control or contraception altogether the progesterone ius may very well be a very useful um solution to her so trying to balance it out so she's not having excess excessive progesterone that could affect the cyst but again that's something that she would need to really sit down with her um specialist with her gynecologist and look at the options available to her so as you said that is that is quite interesting case that we've uh, brought up here okay so let us round up with the last case which is also quite interesting and this again <laughs> this again covers the variances so let's um, let's just move through this one i have been and this is a comment this is not particularly a question but i brought it up because i thought there were a few threads that dr tony might want to share some thoughts around so she says i've been diagnosed with ovarian cyst in the past and had them removed along with my ovaries but now have fibroids they impact on my lower back and bladder so that's the fibroids my my consultant who is black and female seems quick to recommend I have a hysterectomy. I know fibroids are common in us black ladies and I had expected more options. They are common in our culture but I do not personally know anyone within my circle who has them therefore I feel a bit isolated. I am in despair to be honest. I am currently using HRT patches for menopause and they do help those symptoms. I have been seeking a video based in the UK as I am unclear about some of the products suggested in the US videos. Thank you so much. So this is in response to one of um, our videos on our channel. Um, I don't remember which one it was, but it was just, I think it was simply just to release the steam of her experience. And I, perhaps we shared some possible options that hopefully, because that is our purpose sharing these videos, is to provide education. And perhaps you can take that bit of, you can write some things down and say, you know, march off to your doctor's office and say, I had this, that and the other. Can we talk about this? And hopefully open up a discussion discussion and then that that's, that would make me so happy if we could get more women aware that these options are available so dr Tony, what were your thoughts about this particular scenario this scenario is quite challenging because um, i have to <laughs> have a new line because <laughs> she yes. was quite a lot there mm-hmm. you know so um my 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 understanding is this is a lady who's known to have a very insist and as a result has had both of these taken out Mm. He's now currently at HRT. Yes. And my understanding is she's got what looks like pain pressure symptoms rather than bleeding. Mm. So in my mind, I'm thinking, how many fibroids have we got on board? And mm. what's the overall uterine size? Because, yes, a woman can have two or three fibroids, but if each fibroid is like maybe half a centimeter, half a centimeter to maybe a centimeter and a half or so, you can imagine two or three fibroids would not make such a huge difference. Mm-hmm. But if she's got as many as seven or eight or ten, and when the minimum size is between one to two centimeters, you can imagine, accumulatively, that uterine size will be quite considerable. Uh, what I'm happy about is she says that her symptoms are helped by her HR. So I'm beginning to ask myself, are her symptoms actually related to her fibroids? Okay. Because we know yeah. with the menopause, I mean, we've got quite a lot of focus yes. on menopause now um, yes. in the UK at the moment. And that's Absolutely. because we know with the menopause, women will present with varied symptoms. Yes. Sometimes <laughs> with vague symptoms. Very you know, true. Very true. You know, the backache, oh, the leg hurts, mm-hmm. the wrist mm-hmm. hurts, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm beginning to ask if she is so clearly, even without being preempted, has said to me that her symptoms improve with HRT, then I'll be giving her the dog a bad name hmm. and you know <laughs> that he's got nothing at all to do with her fibroids but it's always been with her menopause and maybe optimizing uh hrt might actually help you hmm. know to take away the symptoms completely hmm. uh the only thing i would say with the hrt is i'm hoping given that she's still got her uterus she's got both the estrogen and the progesterone yes. aspect of yes. hrt so as long yes. as that's the case i'm happy with that yeah. Now, she then goes on to say that her doctor has offered surgery. Mm. I would say the doctor might have offered her surgery. And I'm only just being, you know, I'm just trying to think from the other side of the fence. Of course, we don't know. We don't know so much. Now, the doctor might have offered her surgery maybe because she's run out of options with regards to optimizing the HRT mm. without 
pushing her at risk of excessive endometrial stimulation. So endometrial okay. stimulation is stimulating the lining of the womb. Yeah. So the well-being that she's thinking, the options, she's running out of all options now. And the likelihood is, yeah, she increases her estrogen component to it. But unfortunately, that then puts her at an increased risk of the lining of the womb becoming much more thicker and therefore going on, if unchallenged, for yeah. years or you know, yeah. months, depending on what other conditions she has um, in resulting in pre-cancer or even yes so maybe that's why she's offering her the option of surgery so that takes all that away and then they can full, go full blast with whatever hrt intervention they're hoping to um provide her yes however as with everything i would always say make sure you know particularly with the with the medical symptoms you know optimization of the weight optimization of gentle exercises yes um very very important <clears throat> yoga very very important you find that the vasomotor symptoms or the odd, odd vague That's symptoms right. actually yeah. improve with yeah. all this intervention mm -hmm. the, the feeling of being isolated um, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. really can be sorted by coming onto your platform for instance <laughs> so, she's always so welcome she came onto your platforms and she got quite a lot of information but I also believe that there are also quite a lot of um, self-help groups, patient-led groups, you know, support mechanisms to help and support. I don't, I feel sorry for her that she feels isolated because I would want to think, given she's mentioned that the doctor is black just like herself, mm. I hope it's not me making an assumption, mm. that she will have a lot of black ladies or women of black or African extraction like herself who have this problem, but are yeah. not talking about it because, well, maybe the stigma associated with it yeah. impedes their desire to discuss and have discuss, yes, discussion yes. or it be that yes they have it but they've not just even quite recognized what they've had because in many cases they are lucky enough to be symptomless okay mm. or it yeah. just be that they, they just not put you know put the points together and recognize what exactly is going on and sometimes she might need to be the one to actually set the ball rolling she yes. looks around the information she's empowering herself with information so guess what why don't you start the discussion in your local city in your local state and yes. see how people then come to your site or at least you signpost them and you start to have that deliberation yes uh in very common place and this is from personal experience would always be your beautician mm. would be very surprised how many women you meet at the beautician who once they know you have some degree of valid information so not just hearsay not things you've picked up that's not been supported by research but you know valid credible information who mm. would flock to you to listen and glean from you mm -hmm. who you can sign post to different educational portals like yourself mm -hmm. you know to gain more information to gain more understanding and it empowers them because knowledge is power absolutely so, I don't I want her to turn her challenge into an opportunity hmm. rather than see it as a challenge. That's so I need to run into an opportunity and then, you know, run with it. Now with regards to surgery, I think I discussed most of the bits about surgery. I don't want her thinking the doctor was quick to jump at it. It may well be hmm. maybe having a bit more in depth conversation might be able to identify why the doctor was thinking in that direction. Yes. Yes. However, I would want to say with surgery, you have got to always think about the risks of surgery and also the complications of surgery. Yeah. Both short term and long term. And therefore, I applaud a desire to consider non surgical options first. Mm -hmm. If they get to fail, then of course, surgery is something that could be considered. But however, this advice is only limited to what she's said to us. So and yes. we need to have an in-depth you know, discussion. Absolutely. That's spot on. Right? You, you've said it absolutely well. That um, it's, it all depends on what the consultant, her consultant has in front of him or her the her in this case the black lady she said so the information she has about her background and the different other issues that we don't know about we're only speculating here and sort of looking at things from both points of view i think one thing i would say is that there is a little bit of a communication gap between her and her consultant which it would be nice to feel the, the consultant simply explaining what are the other options what are the pros and cons and why is hysterectomy therefore the best option in my mind plus of course she could get a second opinion that's always there um, i think it's important that people get as much information as possible when it comes to their key assets their health and i love what you've said about her starting advocacy for um 
for this for her situation because she's you know it's a sad place to be but you're quite right there are probably many many ladies out there it's just a connection isn't it it's just starting something and then other people will sort of head in your direction oh wow you mean you, you go through this as well well this is what happened to me and that's how it snowballs so i think that is really uh, i think those are really useful tools and tips to know and um, again this was also a very interesting one well i think that brings us very very nicely to the end of this panel <laughs> this panel looking at people's <laughs> real life situations real life circumstances with fibroids you can see that it can be very complicated it's not so simple and straightforward there are many ins and outs and things but as our lovely specialist here likes to say they are challenges but they are surmountable so the first step is having that hope and um, faith and then looking looking for where to get information from we are here to help with information and then reaching out to your doctors and continue to reach out and hopefully for as many people who are as many of my women uh, viewers or even their families relatives who come across this video i hope this has answered um, a lot of your questions and even if it is brought up any other questions please use our email health information service we're there to help to provide you direction, signpost you to different resources, or you speak to your own um, specialists or your own GPs to get information or guidance on these issues. Dr. Tony, you have been an absolute star. Honestly, you have put in so much information that would take people time or so many other resources to get access to, but you've given them to us in a very clear and such relatable manner and we are so grateful for your time thank you so 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 very much you're very welcome thank you very much thank you very much for having me on and to your wonderful <laughs> site <laughs> <laughs> thank you so guys please make sure you follow dr tolu she is at volva doc on instagram and of course please follow us as well at ask away health on all our different social media platforms please um, follow us and of course subscribe to the channel here share this video give it a like it is a lovely sunday afternoon i'm going to leave you to enjoy the rest of your afternoon and the weekend with your family until i see you again thank you so much for watching